District Governor of Penelope of District 23. On behalf of myself and my district lodge, I welcome all of you and thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I know that our grand governor, Sister Xanthi, will be on at some point this evening. I'm not sure if she's on yet, but we welcome our grand lodge members and any other district members that are uh, joining us today. So this past fall, as we sat planning our year out, Sister Kathy Penteris, our Maids of Athena District Lodge Advisor, brought to our attention this very underdiagnosed disease in women, heart disease. And we thought, why don't we try to educate ourselves a little more on this topic by holding a webinar? And what better opportunity than International Women's Day? So in a moment, I'm gonna have Kathy introduce our guest speaker today. And in order to expedite our question period at the end, we are requesting that any questions you may have, if you could please type them into the chat during the presentation. And then at the very end, our secretary sister, Futi Ni, and she's our Zoom guru, She'll read out the questions and then they can be addressed at that point. Um, I think it'll just expedite things at the end. So uh, Sister Kathy, I'll hand the show over to you. Thank you very much, Sister Rula. So Lisa Comber has a degree in psychology from the University of Western Ontario, a diploma in business administration with a concentration in human resource from Algonquin College and a professional certification in knowledge translation through the ho uh, Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. She has over 15 years of experience in the area of learning and development in both high-tech and healthcare settings. Lisa has been with the University of Ottawa Heart Institute since 2009 and currently is the Knowledge Translation Manager for the Canadian Women's Heart Health Center. This dynamic role allows Lisa to manage a variety of local and national projects aimed to educate, inform, and address the gaps of cardiovascular care research and support for women in Canada. Thank you very much, Lisa, for coming tonight and uh, giving us your insight on a few of these things that I know is, again, a number one killer. Actually, on a side note today, Nick said to me that a um, friend of his uh, said that his one of his co-workers, a 30-year-old, his wife, passed away from heart attack. So it's, it's out there, and we need to get more educated on this. So thank you very much, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. I appreciate the introduction. And I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, I feel very privileged and very blessed to be able to have these opportunities to chat with everybody about women's cardiovascular health. Um, and so we talked about knowledge translation, and that's kind of just wanted to let you know where I'm coming from. Uh, I do not have a clinical background, as you just heard for the, the bio. Um, but what my job is and what I'm super passionate about is knowledge translation. And so what that means is taking information that we have from research um, and, and packaging it differently for various audiences. So I'm very uh, fortunate to lead many national summits, so conferences. I do a lot of workshops. I do a lot of content creation for webinars, uh, this presentation that we're going to be talking about today. Um, and I also uh, manage websites and, and all that kind of stuff, project management stuff. Um, and so what I'm going to be talking about today is to give a bit of an overview. So I'm going to share my screen of women's heart health. And I'm going to hopefully, if I have time, talk about a few cool things that are happening across Canada, which is nice because we have some national representation here. And uh, it's nice that uh, I can also kind of uh, relay that and put that lens on, on today's conversation. Can everyone see my screen okay? Yep. Yeah. Great. Okay, cool. So here we go. Um, I wanted to just to highlight, so of course, we're talking about women's heart health. What is heart disease? How heart disease is different in women, um, including signs, symptoms, causes. Talk about risk factors and what um, and how we can take heart healthy action to hopefully prevent uh, or maintain our uh, heart healthy behaviors. Um, and then talking about some tips uh, with uh, when you are having your doctor's appointments and speaking to other healthcare providers. Um, and then if there's time, I would love to uh, explain how the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance, which is my uh, part of my portfolio, I manage the, this alliance, um, and how it's working towards ensuring equitable care for women and cardiovascular disease here in Canada. So what is heart disease? Heart disease is a general term for a variety of conditions 
uh, that affect the heart and blood vessels. So we say cardiovascular disease or heart and vascular disease. Uh, a lot of times in, in a lot of our promotion, we talk about heart disease, but when we say heart disease in RS, in what I'm referring to is cardiovascular disease. So the heart and, and blood vessels. And that heart disease can lead to a heart attack or unfortunately, as Kathy just mentioned, uh, death. So first off, show of hands here on the call, um, how many of you have had experience with heart disease in some capacity, yourself, a loved one, somebody in your personal network. If you want to just raise your hand. Okay, not surprising. <laughs> but uh, so here I have some questions. What, here's the first question. And I think we kind of, perhaps it might be an easy question, I think for the audience here, but heart disease is on the rise and is the leading cause of death for women worldwide. Is that true or false? True. True, you're right. Um, through a question number two, heart attack symptoms can present differently for women than for men. Is that true or false? I think I'm the only one that has a speaker on. True, true. I'm seeing, I'm seeing some, some thumbs. So I'm yeah, assuming we up. all know that's true. Oh, so here's a tricky one. Can you have a heart attack without having a blockage of blood vessels? True. True. False. true? Mm -hmm. Everyone thinking true? True. You're correct. Okay, so here's some facts. Heart disease claims the lives of uh, one in three women worldwide. Uh, Canadian women die from heart disease every 20 minutes. Heart disease is the leading cause of premature death for women here in Canada. It, uh, you all think that, you know, we all, well, I guess maybe just because of promotion or just advocacy or our awareness events and such that breast cancer is going to be the thing that's the, the the disease that's going to kill women most, but actually no, it's heart disease. Heart disease is five times um, kills five times more as many women um, than breast cancer. What's really scary now is that heart events are increasing in our younger and the younger women. So the ages of thirty five to fifty five. When we originally thought that the science and everything was saying older people later on in their lives, but unfortunately now it's becoming earlier in younger people. And then also for those who have had heart disease, one third of women, they just try to resume their pre-diagnosis lifestyle. So they think, okay, I had this heart event. I'm just gonna continue on as per my usual normal. But unfortunately heart disease is a condition that requires lifelong management. So you need to be aware that this is something that you are gonna be having to manage um, for, for, for the rest of your life. So heart disease in women, um, looking at the heart overall, the anatomy, uh, a lot of us think that women just have, are just smaller men. We all have the same heart, same everything, which in essence we do. The, like, you know, obviously the heart muscles and everything uh, look the same, but women's hearts are actually smaller. They beat faster. Um, our coronary arteries are smaller. Our cholesterol plaque buildup is a bit different um, than it is in men. And our hearts are affected by changes in our hormones. So as a result, there are some risk factors that are um, unique or different um, than men. So here are some common heart diseases, uh, common types. Uh, I think you've probably heard of coronary artery disease. And so that's more of a cholesterol buildup in the blood vessels of the heart. We talked about valvular heart disease, um, which is that uh, leaky or like the valve within your heart, which it becomes stiff or a little bit leaky. So the blood flow doesn't really flow as easily between one chamber of the heart to the other. And then arrhythmia, that's when you notice that there is uh, you're having a an irregular or just not the usual uh, beating of your heart. Women, so this is something that we all should be knowing of this, is that women are more likely than men to have SCAD. So that's spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And so I'm, I always like to have these kind of descriptions here and just to let you know, I can share the PowerPoints after this. So no need to take notes or anything like that, okay? Um, and that's the tear in the large blood vessels. Um, and so, and that unfortunately ha happens for women. Coronary vasospasms. And so this is where instead of having a blockage, you might have a heart tightening and squeezing to limit the blood flow uh, from uh, within your heart. Microvascular dysfunction, so that's when you're having uh, diseases of those small vessels uh, within your heart. Takusubo, uh, stress-induced cardiomyopathy, and so that's when the, the muscle of the heart is diseased. And then peripartum cardiomyopathy, and this is a weakening of a heart during pregnancy. 
So because this knowledge um, is, is relatively, well, in the last 20 years or so, um, there are times when some healthcare providers may be less aware of the differences between women and men, specifically what we're talking about here. And so education, which I'll talk about on a national level, is for everybody, uh, for healthcare professionals and for general public as well, um, moving forward. So heart attack symptoms for women. Um, I think what we've all been trained or taught over the years is that you know you'll have a heart attack when you're having an, um, an angry pain or a, a, cruci a crushing pain in your chest, uh, perhaps even having um, you know pain uh, resonating down your arm. Well, that is the case. Chest pain is a common symptom, but women describe chest pain differently. We mostly describe it as a tightness, as a burning, as a, um, a pressure that's in our chest. So if I'm in the emergency department, I might not say I have chest pain, I'm having a heart attack. I might say, I don't know, I feel like there's an elephant sitting on my chest. So we describe it differently. Um, and then also what people have to understand is that, well, women are more likely to present with three or more symptoms in addition to chest pain. So if you think about it, here are some other accompanying uh, symptoms that women might also have is upper abdominal, uh, abdominal stomach pain, jaw pain, back, shoulder, arm, right pain, racing or uneven. So having those heart palpitations, nausea, trouble sleeping, abnormal sweating, um, shortness of breath. I've got major fatigue or I'm just drained and weak. So if you're at the ER and you're in the emergency room and you're saying, I have, you know, I've got this elephant on my chest. Um, and I have this, and my stomach is all out of whack and my, my heart is beating. Well, then, unfortunately, it, it tells the, the, per the person that's at the triage, they're like, oh, well, okay, maybe I'm not going to emphasize the chest pain, aka that person's having a heart attack. I might think that it, I might have to look at other avenues. So it's, um, it, it's just something to be aware of from our perspective, that if you are having any of these types of symptoms, the best thing to do is to rule out a heart attack first. So if you go to the emergency department, which I strongly suggest, you do not doubt, you don't uh, say, oh, I'm gonna, it's gonna be fine, I'm just stressed out. You automatically just, just rule of thumb, go to the eMERGE and get this ruled out because it might be stress, it might be anxiety, it might be all these other things that could be going on, abdominals, cramping, whatever. But you wanna make sure if you have any of these symptoms, specifically that chest pain, crushing chest pain or uh, a tightness, Go to, the, go to the emergency department. So prevention and maintenance. I just wanted to talk about this too, because it's, um, it's important to be aware. Risk factors, uh, be, um, reducing our risk factors before first heart event would prevent or postpone 33% of all deaths. And after a heart event, if you manage yourself, your, your with heart healthy behaviors and so forth, you could reduce potential death by 25%. So there are some things that we have control over that we can we can do to to hopefully prevent an event to happen or also to uh, to help maintain. So here are some risk factors that we can't really change. It's just part of us. Um, it's our age. Unfortunately, we are all getting <laughs> everyone gets older, right? Um, your biological sex, uh, your ethnicity, and then of course, family history. So my example, I have family, I have heart disease on all areas of my family. Like I've got it, every family member, my fam my dad and my mom's side have had some type of heart, heart disease, which is why I'm super passionate about this. And I've been at the Heart Institute uh, for so many years. Um, and so these are types of things that risk factors for heart disease that we don't really have much control over. Also, to let you know um, that there are potential risk factors in women specifically that make women more at, at higher risk for heart disease later on. And, and I don't know if this is something that maybe people are not aware of, but we're really trying to educate on specifically certain pregnancy complications. When, when you know, some women are diagnosed with gestational diabetes or hypertension during pregnancy, and so we're, being, we're dealing with that during the pregnancy. And then once we have had the baby, we think everything's back to normal and, and we can continue on. Well, unfortunately, um, we are now more predisposed for heart disease because of those pregnancy complications. 
if you have had experience for early earlier menopause, so the average age is about 20, about 50 to 70, 52. If you have had uh, menopause around 45 or like under 50, that's something to be aware of and something to note with your family doctor. Polycystic ovarian syndrome. If you've had uh, systemic um, inflammatory or autoimmune disorders, that also makes uh, you more predisposed. And then this is a big one too, cigarette smoking and diabetes. Uh, I was pretty shocked when I when I saw the data about this, but women are three women are three times higher risk for heart disease if uh, you are uh, smoking cigarettes and if you have diabetes compared to men, which is pretty shocking actually the the difference. So I don't want to scare everybody. <laughs> That's not my intention whatsoever. It's all about education and awareness. It's good to know uh, knowledge is power, as we say. So there, but there is opportunities. It's 80% uh, is in our control uh, and it is preventable. So we said, you know, the risk stuff that you can't change, well, it's about 20%. And then the 80% you have control over. And that's all about being active, moving. Doesn't have to be running marathons or like that. It's just walking, it's getting up. It's not sitting at our desks. I should be doing my sit stand desk right now. It's all about just making sure that you're, that you are moving. Uh, eating a variety of healthy foods, managing that stress. We will always have stress in our lives. I think we all know that. Um, but it's how we cope with that stress. It's how we manage, um, how we, you know, doing things that we love, doing things that make us smile. And what you're working, what you're doing here with this group is, is so amazing. Um, and so having enjoyment with others and so forth, that, that really helps with stress levels. Uh, living free from tobacco and commercial tobacco and vaping. Limiting the alcohol, I have a slide on that. So, um, you know, heads up for that. And then getting regular checkups. So making sure that you know what your blood pressures are, knowing what your cholesterol levels, your sugar levels are. Um, getting, just getting the know of the numbers of what you have so that if you notice there's a difference, then, then that's something that you can then work towards and, and looking to address as to why. Um, and then here's my slide that I'm, I don't really like sharing this, but I don't know if you've heard about the new guidelines that have come out recently for alcohol consumption. Um, but I just wanted to mention this, that um, new, you know, new alcohol intake recommendations, less is best. Uh, and so no more than two drinks per day or six drinks per week. So these are the new recommendations for alcohol intake. That's not good. I know, I know. I, I usually try to <laughs> muffle it when I do, when I say <laughs> I do love my wine too. I thought they said red wine's good for you. <laughs> yes, um, which which at the time, but now new science has come out and unfortunately that is not the case. Okay, I don't like the scientists. I know, I know. <laughs> Bearers of bad news sometimes, eh? Yes. Uh, so these are some tips, I think that are very helpful for us to do, to be aware of um, and, and just to be knowledgeable when you are running up to a, a doctor's appointment um, and just to kind of kind of just think of these in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. So we know that doctors, if we have, if we even have a family doctor, I know that it's really uh, difficult to have one or to keep one. Uh, and so if you have an opportunity, it could be your family doctor, or it could be a healthcare professional or a nurse practitioner, whoever you're able to connect with, hopefully on a regular basis, but not, but it's good to, to prepare for your visit, know what you're going to be asking. They have such a short time frame, and it's and, and sometimes they have rules about one item per visit. So it's good to just be very clear and concise about what you're talking about with them. Uh, knowing your medicines. So a lot of the nurses, uh, the Heart Institute, one that I work very closely with, uh, Nasli, she's our APN uh, nurse in women's heart health. Also hypertension, uh, advanced practice nurse when I mean APN, uh, and hypertension and diabetes. So she always recommends to know your medicine, but actually bring your medicine bottles to your appointments. So sometimes you might bring that sheet that comes out of the pharmacist, but sometimes it might not be up to date. Uh, things have changed. And so it's great to actually, or you might not be taking something, you stopped taking that, but you didn't tell the, so it's good to bring your bottles with you <laughs> when you are going to any doctor appointments. Um, you know, using the three questions approach, what's my main health problem? What do I need to do? Why is it important for me to do this? Taking notes is really a big important, uh, just so that you, you, you can be able to, to uh, reflect back on them after your appointment. And this is a big one, especially if you know you've got a, an important, uh, not just a regular checkup, but with a specialist, is to take somebody with you, somebody that can help advocate for you. 
Um, we always recommend this for women um, just, or anybody in general, but anybody that's going through a, a, an appointment where the test results are being provided, good or bad, it's nice to have somebody there to be your advocate. Ask for definitions. If they start throwing out acronyms, I do that too. I always have to make sure that I, I spell them out because uh, there's physician, doctors and, and healthcare people are so used to talking in acronyms. Uh, and so ask for definitions, get clarification. Don't, don't worry about asking questions. You need to ask questions to clarify exactly what they're talking about. Recap after your, after your meetings, uh, after your appointment, and then following up, make sure that uh, if you have questions, don't just wait until your next appointment, follow up with the doctor so that you're able to rest easy moving forward. This is a guide, it's a patient guide that came out a couple of years, well, two years ago maybe, uh, Women's Heart Health Guide from the Heart Institute. It's an amazing resource. If you haven't seen it, I'm gonna share an email after this, which I'll send to the team, and I'd love for them to, to share it with you all. Um, and I'll send the link to this guide. And it's a really great guide. Let's say for some reason you need to go to the emergency department, heavens, like that won't happen, but if you had to, and you think it's a heart issue, bring this guide. Nasli, oh, my colleague always mentions that. She's like, just bring it with you. Any time when we say things across Canada, we always say, you know, this is available to anybody for access. It's free, of course, in English and French. And it just really summarizes everything. Um, and it's come from a reputable organization. And so physicians, uh, they, they are aware of it and they need to, they can read up on it further if they have questions or if they're not answering or helping you get to the answers that you need um, or the tests that you want to take and so forth. So I'm going to just uh, switch gears. I'm just looking at my time. Am I okay? Do I have about 10 minutes left or how long am I? That's okay? Yes, keep going. Okay, just give me this. I have my little timer on, but I just want to make sure I, I'm very conscious and respectful of, of everyone's time. So heart disease in women, um, unfortunately, there are gaps in care. Um, there's, there's gaps in women's cardiovascular health here in Canada. Uh, and so when it comes to heart disease, women are understudied, underdiagnosed, undertreated, undersupported, and underaware. And this came out back in 2018, the Heart and Stroke uh, Foundation uh, published a, a report for Heart Month, and it was titled Misunderstood. And I recall the Canadian Women's Heart Health Centre was launched in 2014. And so we knew of, because of all the research we did to launch the centre, we knew of these unders, but then it was really in black and white in this document. And I read this document and the first time I read it, I was so angry at these, at the fact that we're not getting equitable care and in Canada today. And so I really, that was really just kind of got my passions going and made me think I need to make an effort. I need to advocate. I need to, to help move this, this forward. And this should not have, be happening in 2014 for women here in Canada. So I'm going to talk about why this all is and give a little bit more detail. And then I'm going to talk about what we're trying to do to, uh, to address it. So women are understudied. Uh, unfortunately, um, well, heart disease, um, all the evidence, the information, the research that we know of over the past 50 years has been done uh, by, from women, uh, sorry, uh, Caucasian males. Yeah. So two thirds of the research has been focused on men. Why is that? Why were women not included in the research trials? Why were female animals not included? Why is it that this research that's been done and actually it's still, it's slowly changing now, but it's still happening <laughs> where they are not, people are publishing papers and they're not looking at the sex and gender uh, 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 issues or, you know, they're not even addressing it. And so this is a huge concern because all the research that is done is then brought forward into our training of our healthcare professionals. It's brought forward into the guidelines that they're using. It's brought forward into the screening tools, the procedures, the medication dosing, um, all aspects, even the programming is, is all been done on Caucasian men. So that is a huge red flag and that's a huge issue. So as you can see here in my slide, today women remain under-researched and underrepresented in clinical trials, which then limits understanding of the treatment impacts for women. And it's a barrier for knowledge generation. So getting information out to those that are, that are working with patients and the general public uh, to develop those guidelines that we, are, that we use on a day-to-day -day basis to treat patients. 
And so why were women not included? Safety concerns, hormone fluctuations, and lack of participation. Women, so a lot of researchers didn't want to include, couldn't, well, they might have asked for women to attend, but women perhaps weren't able to go to the hospital to do the research. They couldn't pay for the parking. They couldn't get transportation. They couldn't get childcare to, uh, to look after their children or their, you know, their lives are so a little bit different sometimes that they're not able to get away to be able to participate in research. Um, hormone fluctuation, so the potential for women to be pregnant, with, so then they would just be just taken out of the study. Um, and so that those are some issues that we are trying to address um, and making sure that those barriers for women to participate and to educate women that it would be great, we need you to participate in research, because that is what's going to really impact moving forward all of these other caveats that are the snowball effect of, the, of what research brings to the table from bench to bedside. So from the from the, the laboratory to actually treating patients uh, in the hospital. Women are underdiagnosed. So women are slowly to identify signs and symptoms of the heart attack because we didn't really know. We all thought, well, so you know, I'm having anxiety. I don't need to go to the hospital. It will go, it will get better. I'll be fine. I'm like, it's not a heart event because we didn't know about it. Like we didn't know these symptoms. We didn't, the, the, the studies weren't being done to identify what those, um, the signs and symptoms are for women to, uh, who are having a heart event. And so that's why early heart attack signs are missed by 78% of women, in 78% of women, sorry, not by the women, it's by everybody. And why is that? Well, we delay seeking help. Like I know myself, I went to the eMERGE uh, just because I was having some abdominal issues. Of course, I made sure that it was <laughs> my heart. But then I, I was there and I'm like, okay, I've got two little kids at home, a five and six year old. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go after they've had dinner um, because I know that the you know tra traffic and I know that they're going to be put to bed. So then they won't be missing mom to put them in. So I was like planning how I was going to organize my family so that I could go and get seek treatment uh, in the emergency department. So it's crazy um, that we as women kind of put ourselves last um, and we put everybody else in front of us, even our pets. In, front of, in priority over us. So that's something to let you know is that every minute does count. If you are, let's say, having a heart event and you have a blockage in your heart for, for some, you know, let's say that's the situation. If your heart doesn't get the oxygen, muscles die. So you need to make sure that you get to the emergency department as soon as possible. Undertreated. So the risks of heart disease in women are often underestimated. And we just found out that women are, well, women, well, we didn't find this out, we know this, women are 52% of the population, and yet in guidelines that are being published now are saying that women are still under the special population category. We're, 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 ha we're more than half the population and we're in the special populations. So that needs to change. Guidelines need to ensure that sex, sex and gender considerations are included in the guidelines themselves. And it's not just a subtitle over in the one section of, of the guideline. So that's something that we're looking to deal with. Under supported. So this is after heart diagnose, uh, di disease diagnosis, women are 50% less likely to attend cardiac rehabilitation programming. So after your heart event, you're, well, you should be referred into a cardiac rehab program. Um, and unfortunately, there is gaps, there are gaps in uh, physician of referral. So doctors actually deciding that, oh, they don't, they might not qualify, I'm not going to refer them. Or women are not going to attend uh, because the program is at the hospital, which costs $15 for parking. And I can't get there because it's at 10 a.m. And that's like at a prime time for my day, you know, for whatever. And so, and of course, we put ourselves last. So those are some reasons. Under AWARE, we did a national survey when we launched the, the center back in 2014, uh, just doing a general awareness uh, survey, figuring out, okay, what, what, what do people think? Do they, do they think that you know, heart disease is an issue or it's gonna be, or it potentially is a risk? Unfortunately, only 13% of the Canadian women who were uh, identify, identified heart disease as their greatest health threat. So you know how we talked about, we all think it's gonna be cancer, but heart disease is actually five times more likely. So there is a huge awareness uh, gap in awareness for the general public that this is actually an issue and that we need to be aware of it moving forward. So as I mentioned, the Canadian Women's Heart Health Centre was launched in 2014. 
Um, we had nine initiatives as part of that. One of them was for me to run a uh, or launch a national summit. So in 2016, we had this amazing uh, well international summit that everybody came to Ottawa for. We had a call to action meeting with all these key stakeholders uh, uh, after the event. It was a big meeting. And 16 priority action items came out. And one of them was to develop a alliance or a network where we take with the information that we already know and how can we ensure that like taking that evidence and packaging it and, and pushing it out nationally. Um, and because there were, and so anyways, this alliance, which now, which was started in 2018, now has over 200 members. And these are members that are patients, community advocates, providers, so clinicians, uh, well, a lot, many cardiologists, many, many physicians, uh, trainees, clinical trainees, so undergraduate, um, master's level, um, medical school, residency, um, researchers, and, um, and then of course, policymakers and people that are, are program leads. And these are people where we have a, have a full a vision. The vision is that we are going to improve women's cardiovascular health across the lifespan and working together collaboratively to really start addressing these major gaps. And so we identified, well, at the time uh, in 2018, and I've been very blessed to be the manager of this. So um, I've been able to see it grow and it's just been such a rewarding experience and the highlight of my career. And uh, there are four, there at the time, there were four themes, advocacy, training and education, health systems and policy, research, um, knowledge translation, mobilization. And then we have just received a huge grant, uh, the Canadian Institute of Health Research um, they um, identified the Canadian Women's Heart Health Centre as the uh, cardiovascular uh, heart hub for women, specifically on research. And yeah. so now we have uh, started a new uh, theme on research and knowledge generation. We talked about Heart Month. We talked about Jump In. Um, Wear Red Canada is a national awareness campaign that has started about six years ago. We just finished our last, our sixth campaign. Um, and it's where we're, it's on February 13th of every year. And it's all in support of women's cardiovascular health. And so a lot of our members of the, uh, the alliance then go out into the community and they run awareness events. They run, um, they do a lot of communications on socials, working with media, proclaiming. Uh, we have many cities and provinces uh, proclaiming where we're Canada February 13th. Um, and this is something that we really are really trying to push on a national level. And so anytime that there's an opportunity to highlight women's cardiovascular health through some of these initiatives that we do locally at the, with Jump In, um, and then across Canada at all of the other heart centers, um, is something that we all need to work together for and use the common and have a common voice. We have used, we know that there are, um, not everyone speaks English and French. And so um, we have now developed through the key messages through Wear Red Canada, which highlights exactly what I just talked about today's presentation, risk factors, symptoms, uh, heart disease, talking about the causes, the types, prevention. And we have translated them in 17 different languages. And, and that's in video format, PowerPoint, uh, brochures and posters. And uh, you're welcome to have a look. Um, we have a QR code, but I can, I'll share the link, of course. And it's just all about disseminating to anybody that is that will listen to us. Training in ed, I education, I told you that there are gaps in, in care uh, and awareness or training curriculum. So we have done multiple national surveys um, looking at medical schools, nursing programs, kinesiology, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, respiratory, paramedic, um, and I think physician assistants too, to see where, what is the existing curriculum like? Is there any sex and gender considerations in women cardiovascular health? And would you be open to working with us? So we have been working with multiple universities and colleges, um, trying to incorporate uh, our curriculum into their existing programming. And what's super cool is that there's a lot of members on the Alliance who are professors uh, in, in these university and, and academic institutions who are already embedding content, case studies, persons with lived experience, sharing their stories, um, as well like of, of activities and, and uh, awareness events. So it's happening. Um, and you'll see here, we have connected with high schools. We've got an amazing program that's just been launched a couple of years ago and it's just picking up like wildfire. Um, Post-secondary, we have a cardiology residency pilot project 
We hope to use this as a pilot to reach out to all cardiac adult cardiology residencies and emergency medicine, uh, uh, family medicine, just um, uh, general internal medicine and ob -gynes. Uh, so we are going to then take this model and reach We've already got a major interest uh, to adapt and to adopt this, this uh, pilot project. And we're hoping that this is going to then be a launching pad for other residency programs to pick it up and to adapt to their existing curriculum. And I'm very conscious of the time. I'm at 31 minutes. Do, do I have two more? Yes, yeah. you do. Yeah. Are you if sure? You know what I'm yeah, anybody can leave if they need to. That's okay. Okay. This is something that I wanted to highlight. Uh, women are seven times more likely to be sent home from the emergency department. That is because we are describing our, 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 their chest pain protocol is outdated. Here's me. That's a very, that's a very big statement that I just said. Um, but it's, it's something that we need to address. We need to address the symptoms that women have that are being overlooked. Cause we talked about women are seven, 78 times more likely to be their symptoms to be missed and that more women are going, are being sent home um, and being misdiagnosed or not being treated. And so we have developed a protocol for women uh, for the triage and the emergency department. And this protocol has been recently published. We're doing a national survey, reaching out to all mayor emergency department staff across Canada to see the feasibility, to see whether there's interest, if they're motivated, if there's something that they would be keen on, on trying out and, and piloting. And then the next step is that we are gonna do a multi-site uh, pilot test. And we're gonna look at community, uh, community hospitals, teaching hospitals, those in different provinces and, and rural and urban to really try to see how can we adapt and incorporate. And my hope is that this is gonna be standard of care moving forward. Women in cardiac rehab, of course we mentioned 50% people don't go. That has a lot to do with actually the programming is not inclusive of women whatsoever. And so we have developed, well, I say we, there was international guidelines that came out about two years ago, highlighting about 15 recommendations for, um, for existing cardiac rehab programs to be more women inclusive. And then also what we have done on the Canadian Women's Heart Health Alliance website is to create an online directory highlighting all cardiac rehab programs across Canada so that you are empowered if you, for some reason, were not referred um, you be able, or a family member, and you want to inquire, you have access now to all of the locations and contact information to reach out to the cardiac rehab program across within your unit, within your particular area. We have peer support, super important. Um, women are, the, the probability or the um, chances of, uh, well, women are um, more susceptible to anxiety and depression after a heart event. And so peer support is really important. And we have a national program and we have an online directory talking about the importance of it and that it's accessible, it's free and available in different languages. And so this is something that we just recently launched in November, 2021. Um, I talked about the research and how important it is for women to be, uh, incorporated, be uh, included and participating in research. So our national um, cardi cardiovascular health hub for women with that big grant that we just received. We're looking at creating a trainee network. We're looking at an online patient informed registry so that people can apply for or sign up for research and researchers can promote their research on this platform. And then we are looking at uh, taking the data from, uh, we say Kaihai, it's the Canadian Institute of Health uh, Information. And we're gonna be hoping to push out a couple different publications highlighting the trends in the last 10 years in cardiovascular care and research and awareness. This is an atlas, which is a really great starting point if anyone's keen on this area and this topic to learn more. We've got webinars and publications if you're interested. And uh, our ninth atlas chapter that came out, it highlights 12 recommendations to move forward and to build, to start a national um, strategy in this space. And these are the areas just highlighting, I said there's 12, but we've kind of summarized them into four, clinical practice, research, advocacy, training, and education. Here's some resources if you're interested in learning more about this topic. Of course, I'm very passionate about it. You can reach out to me at any time if you have any questions. Um, but make sure that you know your, you all know your bodies the best. You are all experts in your body. If you notice that something's not right, what you know, it's kind of, you know, when in doubt, check it out. 
be sure to do that. Don't, don't dismiss it. Make sure that you go and get it checked out. It's super important. Okay. And that's it. Oh, and of course, we can't do, we can do more with more people. We have 200 volunteers that are participating on this alliance. We can always do, do with more people. There's so many opportunities to volunteer if you're interested in the space. Um, and I'd love to chat about more if, you, if, if that's something that, you, that you'd like to pursue. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Lisa. That's, uh, you know what, mm -hmm. I, I thank you very much for being an advocate for us women, first of all. I'm totally shocked that in 2023, um, it's so unequitable in, uh, in Canada. That's unreal. And the numbers are just staggering. I'm, I'm blown away by those numbers. I think, um, I don't think people put questions in the chat. I think we can open it up. Uh, we don't have a huge number on. So I think that it can work that we can actually just have verbal questions. If anybody has something they would like to ask, then you can unmute yourself and go ahead. I, so may I ask a question? Okay. Um, just wondering uh, for the, uh, I don't even know how to say it, value, valvular mm -hmm. disease heart disease um does that just can you explain that one again for me and then like how how is that preventable how is how is it preventable yes yeah uh, it, what is it exactly and then what um is that so, what yeah valvular heart disease is when you're having some challenges uh with your valves so the pipes um of, of your heart and so I actually, if this is something that you're interested in learning about for valvular heart disease specifically, I can send you some information about that if you like. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. we have a, we have heart guides and such, uh, which really talk about the, 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 the symptoms that you would potentially be experiencing, what type of tests would be, rec would be recommended during that space, what kind of procedures, and then the treatment uh, as well. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I can definitely do that. Uh, I did get three questions. Um, the first question came from Kathy, mm -hmm. uh, who said, why are young women getting heart attacks? Is it food, stress? What is the reason why younger women are getting heart attacks? Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, it's unfortunately, when you look at the stats for the World Health Organization, there was the big piece was that heart disease is on a rise in Canada and the United States, actually. So, and men and court men, it's plateauing, it's plateauing, plateauing, and it's leveling out, but women in certain countries are, are going up and that could be so many reasons. Um, and a lot of it has to do, of course, with our lifestyle choices. Um, and then also it's just, um, you know, lack of, uh, lack of, 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 of health monitoring and knowing the symptoms. So we all think, and then also what it is, is that people say, if you're going to the heart to going into the, the hospital and they're like, you're too young to be having a heart attack. It's probably something else. So a lot of these women are having heart issues and it could be congenital, could be from when they were younger, but a lot of times it might not be, but people are being dismissed. And, and because it's not the usual of what we know, we all know it, it usually happens based on age later on in life. Women are actually usually because of our, when we go through menopause, it's kind of delayed 10 more years because estrogen really actually protects our heart, but it has a lot to do with some of the other aspects that it's now becoming more and more um, knowing of it. And, this, and the, the tests are slowly becoming more um, available depending um, and so that women are being diagnosed earlier too which is, is nice, it's work, it's, it's helping, but there needs to be a lot more uh, effort in, in that, in the diagnose, in the screening and the diagnosis components. Okay, so our next question is from Kathy, but this time Kathy from Toronto. Uh, what is the correlation between RA and heart disease? R, oh, um, rheumatoid arthritis and heart disease, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it's uh, the immune system, um, so actually, let me just share, I have a really great infographic that gives more information about that too. So I can, uh, I can share that too. This is what's so great about infographics and being able to just share with you all very easily. Um, one sec. So I can, oops, can you, is this the right screen? Did I share the right screen here? Can you see this all? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, yeah. so you'll see this. Uh, these are infographics that we have developed. This is within the Canadian Heart Health Center. 
Um, and we have here cholesterol and heart diabetes, smoking, high blood pressure, pregnancy, physical activity, uh, the autoimmune and her heart. So I find for me, I just, I spit, I say a lot of statistics, but this particular topic, I, I'm not, I don't have any statistics right off the bat. So I always like to go through the information. Um, oh, hold on. Oh, it's thinking. Lisa, just while that's coming up, will you be able to Please. share these with us so that maybe we can put them on our website and share them with our members? Of course, I can definitely. It'd probably be easier if I shared. Um, okay, so here, here you'll see women are three times more likely than men to have rheumatoid arthritis, 9% more to have lupus. Uh, and then it talks about the risks. Um, and yeah, so then there is heart disease is the number one cause of death for people with rheumatoid arthritis or lupus. So it just talks about risk factors uh, and it talks about the immune system uh, causing uh, damage or dysfunction to the body. Um, and it, uh, so it kind of just relates to what heart disease then would then be impacted because of, of the, the compromising that's happening within the body through this particular uh, autoimmune diseases. So I'll share this information. And then I also probably have um, one of our chapters when the Atlas does talk about it further too, if you're interested in more information. So I'll okay. put that in my chat, in my notes. Great, thank you, Lisa. You could send it to me, Lisa, and then I could uh, forward it to all the presidents like through the secretary, like, okay. yes, I could, we could figure that out. We'll, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll also maybe see if we can put it right on our website so okay. everybody else can access it too. Awesome. Great, that's perfect. That okay, works. so then we have the next question is from Kathy number one again. Uh, where to go? Sorry. Uh, is sleep apnea a big concern uh, on women and can it create arrhythmia and heart disease? Um, I have to look into that. I'm really sorry. I don't have any evidence offhand to, to share. Um, but sleep apnea, of course, is something that many people are experiencing. And, but I, unfortunately, this, I don't, I don't know the correlation, but I can look into that for you and get that information for you. Thank you. And now, um, Bessie asked and Sevasi seconded, how do we join heart health studies in our local area? Great. Um, so, Well, this big, so locally, the Heart Institute uh, definitely has um, research that's available and it's posted, I believe, on the ottawaheart.ca website. So in an Ottawa specific um, and from from all the other locations, uh, we do have women's heart programs. So let me just get my website out here. I'd like to share this really interesting in this page. Um, the the big um, online directory that I mentioned, it's we're in the midst of planning it right now. I don't foresee it actually being launched because it's a big it's big um, and it's going to be a really um, matching type of it's going to be a huge system. So I foresee that probably and it's a four year program that or grant that we have. So I probably foresee it being launched in the next 18 months to two years. Um, and so at that point, you will have national access because a lot of these research uh, studies are, are available across Canada. So a lot of times and, and just, you know, studies like they range, like you could participate in a study where you would have to go maybe in person once or you could go um, or you're doing a survey or you're doing, you know, so there's so many different types of research that is being done. Um, and so that you don't need to be worried about, oh, it has to be local. Um, so just keep that in mind as well. Um, I'm going to share again, I should just probably just keep this open. So this is the Canadian Women's Heart Health uh, Alliance website that uh, that we have. And under here, you'll see what I talked about uh, for programs and clinics. We have the cardiac rehab programming and peer support programming. There are women heart programs across Canada. Currently, there's six. Um, there's one that's opening up in, in Saskatoon. Um, and there's talk about another one opening up in Regina. Um, and I think that Winnipeg is slowly going to be coming that is launched an inst a research institute. So we, our goal is, is that there should be a women's heart health program, uh, similar to the, we have in Ottawa, Toronto, Montreal, there's women's heart health clinics, 
or Women's Heart Health Programming um, that is really an amazing initiative because people then can be referred for specialized care. Um, and so for instance, like they address heart conditions and risk factors for disproportionately impact women such as, so there's some information about this. In, my, in this directory that we launched, um, women's heart clinics are listed here and you'll see them all. And we have Vancouver, the Leslie Diamond Women's Heart Health Center. Um, in Toronto, there's the Women's College Hospital. Um, actually, there's a couple of projects, a couple of groups working on um, uh, in Toronto. The, uh, in Montreal, there's two. There's the SHUM and then Montreal Health, um, Montreal University Health Center. Um, there's also one in Halifax. And so all of these groups, all of these um, centers or women's heart programs are all doing research or they are associated with a university that is doing research in this space. So, because I know a number of you are not from the Ottawa area, I would highly recommend going to these sites and looking on their websites to see if they do have research happening and if so, how you can join. But my goal, of course, is to have a one-stop shop is that everybody can access um, one particular directory or one particular website or database to then access that for research opportunities. Yeah. So that's what I would recommend. Um, at the Heart Institute, uh, we've got lots of research going on. And so please feel free to go to ottawaheart.ca and, uh, and see what, what's going on in terms of research that we'd love for you to participate in. Um, that's all the questions that I had in the chat. Okay. Yes, I I, my, my question is non-heart related. It's just that before everybody takes off, I'd like to take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> my usual question. <laughs> Why don't we do that? now and if anybody else has a question we'll ask one more time and we can go from there okay so we'll get ready and i'll i'll get my little square done <laughs> <laughs> all right so everybody just look at your cameras and smile for me one two three thank you yes thank, thank you for me any other questions you. before we finish off not question the only thing i know from the can you hear me? Yeah. Um, that on also the web, the website too, they have different seminars and different web, web uh, webinars. If you ever would like to see other um, things that do show up, there's a lot of information out there and uh, it's a, it's, we are very blessed to have the Ottawa um, heart center here for women. And, and it's, it's a great, it's a great cause because again, we unfortunately, have that being our number one uh, killer and uh, taking care of our hearts. We take care of everybody else with ourselves too. So thank you very much, Lisa, for sure. helping us out, giving us all this understanding. It's It was wonderful. Uh, nice to meet you through Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I would say exactly the same. <laughs> I, I would say exactly the same, Lisa. Yeah. We're so happy to have you with us tonight. Um, I can't even believe, like I said, the numbers are staggering. Uh, one Canadian woman every 20 minutes. That's unbelievable. Uh, I hope that tonight helped us each understand a little bit more about women's heart health and uh, gave us the tools that are going to help us to recognize those early signs, like you said, um, and make the lifestyle changes we need to so that we can prevent it and hopefully educate our daughters, our sisters, our friends, more so on women's heart health. Um, so it was a very informative presentation. Um, I hope that anyone who uh, would like to uh, will either uh, visit the links that we will post or visit your website to get more information. Uh, if you can donate, if you can volunteer your time, uh, I know any of that would be appreciated uh, and would help uh, us make a little bit of a stronger impact out there in terms of spreading the word. So uh, on the final note, we wish all of you a very happy International Women's Day and remember to celebrate all those special women in your lives. Amazing. Thank you for the opportunity, everybody. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very Bye. much. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. -bye.